Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, is Ubuntu at the end of its era? It's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And this isn't like, kill Ubuntu! No, far from it. I like Ubuntu. I've generally always liked Ubuntu, but I see some of the directions that they've made in the past few years actually... I think have hurt it more than have helped it. And that's kind of sad because most people, and yeah, there's going to be a few exceptions out there. You can tell me all about not me's in the comments if you would like. Tell us what distro you started off with. But most people who are trying out Linux or have switched to Linux at some degree have started on some version of Ubuntu, usually the regular Ubuntu, mostly because early on it was very easy to find. I first learned about Linux and through Ubuntu when I had a crappy compact computer. No, it wasn't compact. It was a crappy Acer computer, I think it was. And they built the frame wrong on this and literally they they screwed the hard drive directly into the hard shell chassis of the computer. And that meant if you just slid the computer across the desk, it sent all those shocks directly into the hard drive. The thing burnt two hard drives in three months. I said, I'm done with putting hard drives in here. Like, can I install Windows on an external hard drive? No, but I found out about this thing called Ubuntu that could. I'm like, let's try it. So I downloaded Ubuntu. And I think that was version 11.04. And I installed it. And this was pretty cool. Now, I didn't switch to Linux entirely then. But I thought this was a pretty cool system. And I kept that around for a while. And that was kind of my introduction into it. Because the available information was out there. And I was able to find it when I was trying to solve a problem that I couldn't solve on Windows. Now, yes, all you guys that are going to tell me about it. Windows 10 now can run off an external hard drive. Windows back before 10 could not. So uh, that's just one of those things to, uh, to keep in mind. So in context of my story, this was a while back. Ubuntu 11.04. That means it was about 2011. Okay. Um, and so with that, I got into it. And then when Windows started going crazy with forcing OneDrive, forcing cloud services, forcing Windows 10 and their data collection... I remembered that Ubuntu drive that I had, I'm like, where is that thing? And I went and I plugged it in and it worked beautifully. And I said, this is a great system. And it was certainly better than Windows 10. And so I made the switch over to Linux. Now, for those curious, not familiar with this channel, I actually use Linux Mint Cinnamon as my daily driver for my production systems because it has the exact workflow. That's the only thing I didn't like about Ubuntu is that it didn't have a layout like Windows and it was very inefficient for my workflow. And I started looking around at other Linux distros after learning them, you know, a little bit more under the hood about Ubuntu and how it would work. And I found Linux Mint. And that was end up being the perfect distribution for me. And that's why I just love my Linux Mint. But the thing is, is that we have started to see Ubuntu decline in over time. In fact, the very first video I did that put this channel on the map was about Ubuntu. And I raised this question is, oh, what version was that? I think that was, was that 8, 17? I think it was 1704 maybe. Whatever was supposed to be shipping with Unity 8. And I forget which one it was. And I did a video and I remember it was like on New Year's Eve and I did the video about Ubuntu with a are questioning, is this really the future of Ubuntu? And that is the video that put this channel up on the map. That's the one video that launched this channel. Prior to that, I'd been doing videos for a few months with, you know, 15, 20, 30 views maybe. But after I had that video on Ubuntu, questioning is Unity 8 really a good direction for Ubuntu? And I got all, you know, about as many likes as as many dislikes in a very controversial video. And I ended up being right. A total noob to the Linux sphere, and I was right. They dropped Unity 8, they dropped Unity altogether, and they decided to go back to GNOME. And that's kind of what they did. But you need to understand that at that time, I had erased my 11.04, and then I had installed 16.04 pre-alpha. And I ran 16.04 in, I think it was November or December, I was running it since then, and it worked flawlessly. It worked beautifully in a virtual machine. It worked beautifully on hardware. It was 
an amazing Polish system, and I was such a noob, I didn't even know it wasn't released yet. Huh? Literally. Huh? And so when I found that out, I was like, really? This runs this well before it's even released? That was a revelation to me. But then, of course, we had this push on Unity 8, which was a, an abysmal failure. If you remember anything about Unity 8, it was an abysmal failure. It was this horrible garbage. And then we had dropping to that and going back to GNOME. And then that really made Ubuntu less shiny. It didn't have its own identity anymore. You know, you watched videos where you knew they were on Linux. You could spot that Unity in a heartbeat. And sure, you can still spot GNOME fairly well. You can generally still tell it's Ubuntu, but it doesn't show quite as much. And yeah, if you used Ubuntu before Unity when it was GNOME 2, yeah, you wouldn't recognize it as much. But it's these little tinges of excitement, these little marketing blips. But the th the thing is, is that they started moving in these interesting directions where they dropped Unity. They went back to GNOME. And then they started focusing so much on snaps. And then for me, and I think for a lot of people, it just kind of, eh. you know, Ubuntu Mate became probably the more run Ubuntu than Ubuntu, which is interesting. And so this brings me up to this. So I jumped onto DistroWatch today to see, what do I want to talk about? Is there a cool distro? I'm like, no. You know what? It's like halfway through February. I haven't heard anything about Ubuntu 19 yet. Usually, man, I'm starting to hear about Ubuntu up to leading up to the months. And in marketing, you would call that creating buzz. You release your alphas. You release your videos. A bunch of guys like me and DT and a bunch of other guys start booting up virtual machines. My apologies. Uh, booting up virtual machines and, and installing stuff and playing around with it and you're seeing videos and your news feed starts to fill up with Ubuntu stuff and then this is all leading into the release day and it comes out and it's highly anticipated and it goes. And I said, this is halfway through February. I haven't heard anything about Ubuntu yet. So I started to investigate this. Here's the release schedule for this release of Ubuntu. So October 25th, the tool chain is uploaded. All right. Feature definition freeze in November. They start doing a little bit of tweaking throughout December, and then they have an optional Ubuntu testing week. Another optional Ubuntu testing week. You know what's not here? There's no alpha release. They did not release an alpha of Ubuntu, which means that they are going to be releasing an Ubuntu build, which has less testing, less awareness, less everything than they've ever had before. I haven't seen anybody spin this up yet, which means they're not collecting data from who's installing it. They're not collecting data from the videos like this. They're not getting in and doing a lot of the things they've done in the past, which have led them to getting a lot of feedback, a lot of discussion early on, which basically means it's kind of becoming like Windows. It's all becoming inbred among their own developers in a very small knit community that follows a development chain that's not the rest of us. And that is an interesting thing because what's going to happen is now I'm recording this today on February 20th. Well, tomorrow from when I'm recording this, February 21st is the feature freeze. This is when no more features are going to be added. They're going to do a Debian import freeze and then they have a week of testing. They have a UI testing, documentation string freeze, and then the beta release. The first time a beta hits the market is March 28th only three weeks before the mandatory release of 1904. Very little buzz, very little discussion, very little testing, very little comments, very little feedback. And this is the distro that a lot of other distros are based on. Now, to be fair, this is not an LTS. So 1904 is probably not going to be the thing that a lot of distros are going to be based on, but it still raises some question. Why drop the alpha from your release? Why not release multiple betas? This is a fascinating question to me. So is there anything special? 
Well, the release date's scheduled for April 18th, and it seems to be hard, fast, and mandatory, despite only having three weeks on a beta, no alpha, and no other real discussion. No real buzz being created by the core group of people who are the Linux evangelists. Fascinating. So the feature freeze occurs February, UI freeze, March, kernel freeze, April 1st, no alpha release. Okay. Beta release March 28th, only three weeks before the final release. And then they're going to hit the release date after only three weeks of beta testing with very little input. What do we expect? Nothing. GNOME 3.32, kernel 5, GS Connect. They originally talked about having GS Connect, which is a way to wirelessly connect a, an Android-based device to Ubuntu. That's getting dropped. A lot of other things are getting dropped. There's nothing exciting anymore. There's no marketing buzz. There's very little testing. There's very little anything. But just about two hours ago, Quint sends me this interesting little piece of news. 1904 is going to replace apt with snap as the default package manager. <laughs> I'll get into why this is an issue later. Uh, let me zoom this up so you guys can probably read it better. There we are. All right, although apt has multiple fantastic front ends, it is uh, like most package management systems dating to the early 2000s can be a pain to configure at times. Before there were systems, uh, let's see, so before it was Snap and other tools, especially app images, which are by far the cleanest solution available that allowed apps to be self-contained, we had to deal with problems that are PPAs a ma and massive dependency problems in the event that a vendor decided to bypass the repositories altogether and distribute a standalone package. Thanks to Snap, the need for apt is disappearing fast. Apps ranging from browsers, Firefox and Chromium, all the way to complex developer tools, Android Studio, are available as these self-contained Snap packages. So why don't we use Snap at the system level? Imagine, for example, being able to run sudo snap install cosmic to upgrade the current release, sudo snap and call beta disco in March to upgrade the beta release, or for that matter, sudo snap install edge disco to upgrade to the pre-beta release. It would make the whole process much easier and updates could simply be delivered to the corresponding snap, which could then be pushed to the repositories and there it is. This way, instead of having a separate release updater, it would be possible to A, run all system updates completely and silently in the background to avoid nagging the user, and B, offer release upgrades in GNOME Software Store Mac style as banners so the user can install them easily. It would make the user experience both a consistent and even more user-friendly than it currently is, giving developers an easy path to migrate apps over to Snaps and encouraging the community to build Snaps for OSs that isn't yet available to them, e.g. Qt Creator would definitely be a must, however, before this is implemented. So. I want to focus on these two points he's talking about. Number one, run all system updates completely and silently in the background to avoid nagging the user. Have you gone mad? Like how many times does an update break a system? It's still fairly rare, but the last thing I want to occur is for a whole batch of updates to be running in the background. There is a very good logical argument for not pushing all these upgrades silently without nagging the user. There is a reason a lot of businesses still use Windows 7 and Windows XP despite end of life either being passed in the case of XP or rapidly approaching in the case of 7. Because there's reasons not to change. This is exactly why I am still running Linux Mint 18.3. Everything works. I'm not going to risk breaking the system and giving myself a, down, a day of downtime to repair a system because an update wanted to go in the background without talking to me about it first. That is insane. And it kind of makes me scratch my head and go, man, Canonical is starting to become like Microsoft. That is a scary thing.
Now B, offer release upgrades in the GNOME software store Mac style as banners so the user can install them easily. You know, I have a solution to this. Why don't you fix your GNOME store? Because you didn't have a problem with this before you switched to GNOME. If I go into the GNOME store of every Ubuntu I've installed, guess what's not there? A simple application like Thunderbird, which is there in the repository. I can sudo apt install Thunderbird, but I can't seem to find it in the GNOME store. And this seems to be a problem with the GNOME store on Ubuntu. It seems to be lacking a lot of software that is otherwise available to the system. I don't see a problem with that as an end user. I'm not a developer, so I can't speak to that. But as an end user, I don't see that as a major issue. I don't see that as a major problem. Now, why am I against snaps? It actually comes back to, this is an article from almost a year ago, uh, May 15th, 2018, when some malware was discovered in a snap package. And so snap comes out, this is the official snap blog, when snap comes out and kind of talks about this, and they had some very concerning things. Okay, down here in software views, of course, these guys are the evangelists for Snap, of course. They want everyone to be using their system. All right, so this is what I found the most concerning part. Even then, the inherent complexity of software means it's impossible for a large-scale repository to only accept software after every individual file has been reviewed in detail. That's true whether source code is available or not, as no institution can afford to review hundreds of thousands of incoming source code lines every single day. Because of that, the most successful trust model is based on the origin of the software, not its content. In other words, trust the publisher rather than the application itself. Which basically means we are going to reduce our overhead by not auditing the software in the repository and instead we're going to pass fail the distributor of the application instead where has this gotten us in the recent debates with the apple stores remember this issue where they could you know facebook was releasing this application in a backhanded way to users by releasing through the development chain channel that caused a major spyware issue and then after Apple's like, don't do that, then they find out that tons of other pirates are doing the same exact thing. Now, yes, those are pirates, but Facebook is one of these companies they are talking about, let's trust the publisher rather than the application itself. Who are the publishers? Well, Mozilla, Amazon, Spotify, Google, Microsoft. I don't trust these publishers. Yeah, Microsoft and Google and Spotify and Amazon are not going to be putting malware in my system, but they will be putting tracking software. They will be spying on everything I do. And now Snap and Canonical can look the other way. We trust the developer. We're not going to audit their code anymore. And that is completely counter to the entire philosophy of Linux as a whole. And that is why I think Ubuntu is at the end of an era. They have forgotten their user base. They have ditched the thing that made them unique. Um, what we'll look at here is, is by the way, this pre-build won't even run well on a virtual box. I can get it booted by booting it off of the recovery mode, but I can't actually boot the thing up to test it out. I can't even go full screen with it. The thing works worse than the first ever Linux build I've ever experimented with. That's how bad it's become. So I think Ubuntu is at the end of the era, and I think it's probably about time other distros think about looking to other places instead of basing themselves on Ubuntu, because Ubuntu is starting to integrate Snap at a, a core level. And with that, I think that we're going to be losing a lot of the trust behind it. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Is this the end of Ubuntu's era? Let me know. Yes or no? And why do you think so? So thanks for coming along.